Good evening and welcome to virtual worship at Patchwork Central. It's good to have uh, folks with us online. It looks like we have Sean, Darlene, Natasha, and Karen are all here. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, so please, uh, as we usually do when we gather in person, we say our names, but here uh, you can simply put your names in the comments section. Amy's here. And uh, we'll all know uh, that we're here and we'll gather in community even though it is virtual and not in person as we would wish. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes too. You can start thinking about if you would like to offer prayer requests, gifts, or announcements. Uh, please feel free also to type those into the comments section at any time uh, because there is a bit of a delay between when you type it in and when I see it and can actually talk about it. So uh, if you go ahead and do that now, then I can try to incorporate that into the service as we get to that section. Um, so let's see what we got here. Helen and Jean are here. Bill and Gail are here. Sean has a prayer request. Thank you for putting that in, Sean. Oh, Scott is here. Hey, Scott. All right. So we're saying our names, gathering in community, uh, even through the, the screens and the interwebs. Um, and next is celebrations. Do we have anybody with a birthday or anniversary or other day of celebration? Randy Pease is here. Great. Good to have you, Randy. I didn't see any birthdays on the patchwork calendar here in the kitchen. Um, so I don't know of any. Uh, so we'll move uh, right along and get into uh, our worship service proper. So tonight I thought I would uh, preach the gospel to you. I know, shocking, new. Um, but no, a couple of weeks ago I was trying to figure out what to preach uh, at my church, at Eastside Christian Church, uh, which, as many of you know, uh, was in the process of closing, and today was its final worship service. Um, and trying to figure out what to preach for those last few Sundays. I mean, the last Sunday, you kind of, you know, it's going to be the last one, and you kind of have some ideas about what to say on the actual last day. But then, what do you do for those three or four Sundays leading up to that? And so I thought, well... Um, I was uh, considering, well, I, why don't I just, why don't uh, I figure uh, on preaching what I think is at the heart of the gospel? Just what do I think the gospel is really all about? Uh, and you may have some slightly different wording or frame it slightly differently, and that's fine. That's part of the life of faith is that we're a community. We all have different perspectives and different interpretations. Um, hopefully we uh, get you know, a lot of the central parts of it uh, together, but um, if you have a slightly different wording or a slightly different interpretation, that's fine. I'm just presenting sort of what strikes me as the most powerful, um, most resonant uh, um, proclamation of the gospel for me. Ah, Helen says it is Yoko's birthday today, so Yoko Eratani. So I uh, don't think she's watching, but um, for those of you who knew Yoko when she was here as part of the Patchwork community, we wish her a very happy birthday. Uh, that's lovely. All right, so uh, I'll, my scripture passage, like I said, I take this to be pretty much uh, the heart and the essence of the gospel. And it's very short, although uh, sort of deceptively simple. So the scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 34 through 36. Listen for the word of God. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Will you please join me in a short prayer? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds 
be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So like I said, that's what I take to be the distilled essence of the gospel, that concentrated proclamation, and it is in the form of a paradox. A paradox, of course, is something that is a, a statement that is seemingly contradictory on its surface, but when you delve deeper, it reveals a truth about life, about existence, about reality. And so you can think about some of the paradoxes that you think are true. Um, some of the ones that I think of when I think of paradox, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The, the old French proverb, plus ça change, plus ça même chose. Um, change is the only constant, very similar kind of different way of putting that. Uh, another paradox, one of the surest ways to succeed is to keep failing. Um, or pursuing your own happiness makes you unhappy. And perhaps you can uh, think of how these paradoxes apply to your own life. You can also think about paradoxes of your own. Um, so, oh, Jane and Nils uh, are here, and Karen uh, is thankful for the 50th anniversary year of American Lutherans ordaining women. Uh, she joined folks at St. Paul's in Vincennes today as one of seven women pastors who have served them over the years. Congratulations, Karen, and indeed, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of American Lutherans ordaining women. That's fantastic. Um, so back to these paradoxes. So in this short passage from Mark, this uh, statement from Jesus, we have in, in my reading four, four interlocking and interconnected paradoxes. And uh, I'm gonna, I want to look at them one at a time and then talk about how they kind of relate to each other and talk about how they form the heart of the gospel, uh, at least for me. So, um, the first part, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, there's sort of a paradox within a paradox in that sentence, so I'm going to take a kind of slice one phrase out and, and focus on another phrase here first. So I'm going to take out the phrase of take up their cross. And I'm just going to focus on the, if, anyone want, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and follow me. So you have to understand some of the Greek words at play here, because there's a lot of wordplay uh, in Jesus' framing of these paradoxes. So <clears throat> there's a word that does not appear in this sentence, but you, if you know the Greek and you know Jesus, it's going to be echoing in your ears. And the word is aparnasasasto. Um, and that is to reject, to reject Jesus, or to reject God. And so you'll often read this uh, in the New Testament or in the Gospels, you know, so-and-so re rejected the Son of Man. Uh, certain Pharisees reject Jesus. Certain scribes reject Jesus. And this reject verb is the opposite of the follow verb. So if anyone want to... If any want to become my followers, let them reject themselves and follow me. Do you see the paradox there? How do you reject yourself, leave yourself behind and follow Jesus? Because wouldn't you be left behind, but then you're supposed to follow Jesus? It's a paradox, you see. Um, and then we also have to talk about this Greek word that's translated self. Uh, and in Greek, that is psuche. And it is the root of a lot of English words like psyche, psychology, psychiatry, uh, those kinds of words all come from this Greek word psuche. And it's, you can't really translate it with a single English word. It, it can mean mind, uh, as, we've off, as we've translated it into English as psychology, study of the mind, psychiatry, healing of the mind. Um, but it's not just the mind. It, it is the self, it is the soul, it is the life. So it, can, it has all of those different connotations and shadings of meaning when you talk about the psuche. So then it gets even more complex because you're talking about rejecting your own psuche and following Jesus. So, you have to, so how does one do that? Uh, and, I'm, and I'll be honest, I'm not really sure, but when Jesus is talking about this, um, obviously he's going to be talking about uh, what would you give to gain the world? Would you give up your soul to gain the world? There's a lot of Jesus versus the world here. 
So I think a lot of what Jesus is talking about is the self that is formed and molded by society, by the world, by human institutions. And so when we have this self, this psuche, that Jesus is telling us to reject, it's not all of who we are necessarily, but it is the self, the mind, the soul that belongs to the world that we are supposed to reject. And so I, uh, and to, to get to kind of deepen this paradox a little bit, I have a story when uh, I was in divinity school. I was in a class of Christian ethics, a very common class, a requirement, and I had a professor, his name was Dr. Schweiker, I really, I liked him a lot, very good Christian ethicist, uh, very, very precise and clear thinker and theologian. Uh, and we were actually having dinner with him one night. He had dinner with uh, students somewhat regularly. Uh, and this conversation turned to how do you do interfaith dialogue authentically? How do you do uh, talking to people across different sets of beliefs, different frames of reference for reality, your perspective on life? And he said, and he said, you know, you, you have to, you really have to reach out. You really have to kind of give up yourself to enter into these conversations, to really be there to receive, to empathize, to connect with people who are different, to connect with the other, capital O, other. And so I brought up this question. I said, well, how, you know, how do you do that balancing act? How do you maintain your own Christian identity? Uh, and in my opinion, and in my mind, and I think he read this in my tone of voice and my body language was, how do I defend Christianity when some people attack it and continue to reach across aisles and reach across gaps to connect with people who are other uh, than I am. And I will always remember Dr. Schweiker's answer because it struck me so hard and so full of truth. He said, then you give up your Christian identity. And that paradox that the most Christian thing to do sometimes is to give up our identity of being Christian so that we can reach across those gaps, so that we can connect with the other. Because let's face it, there are a lot of things about Christianity, modern Christianity, especially American Christianity, that are roadblocks and stumbling blocks and challenges for someone who claims to be a Christian to connect with people who are not. And so he said, so the most Christian thing to do is to give that up so that you can reach across and connect. And I, that has always stuck with me in that paradox of the most Christian thing to do sometimes is to give up one's Christian identity for the other. Um, so now I wanna go back to that, uh, to that phrase that I excised out earlier, that phrase of uh, take up their cross. And so this is that paradox within a paradox. If you've ever seen the movie Inception, this is sort of paradox inception. Um, so take up their cross. Again, we have to look at the Greek. So take up in Greek is arato, and that means literally to raise up, to lift up. And the image is that you're lifting up the cross beam of the cross. But to raise up is not just about lifting something that's heavy. It's not just about suffering a burden, a physical burden that then metaphorically gets turned into an emotional or spiritual burden. There is absolutely that, that element of it, but it is also to lift up to show the world, to show everyone. So to lift up your cross, because remember in this time, um, the cross was a very shameful death because it was meant not just to torture the body, it was also meant to disgrace the person that it killed, it was meant to dishonor their family, it was meant to dishonor anyone who followed them as a disciple, for instance. So it was a very shameful death. It was reserved for criminals and slaves and terrorists. So for Jesus to say this paradox of you want to lift up, show everybody, display, the thing that is shameful to the world. And so we can think about the kinds of shameful things that might be part of our identity that Jesus is saying, you know, the world tells you to hide that, 
to pretend it doesn't exist, to deny it, to cover it up at all costs. But Jesus says that's the part of you that you need to lift up. And so if we are an addict or a survivor of abuse, if we have a different sexuality, if we have some different way of being in the world than the world accepts, we lift that up because what others considered shameful and dishonorable and disgraceful Jesus says you need to show that. So it's not just about rejecting yourself to follow Jesus. It's about taking those parts of yourself that the world uh, derides and lifting them up uh, almost proudly. And, uh, and Paul says this, that, that, our weak, that uh, God's strength is made perfect in our weakness, in our vulnerability. So now not only do we reject self to find a true identity in Christ or even to leave our Christian identity behind to become more Christian, but we are also lifting up that which, at least the world says, is always meant to be hidden and tucked away and shoved down and never acknowledged. So those two paradoxes are interrelated. And then we get a third paradox— Those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. And I take this as the central paradox of this whole interlocking chain of paradoxes. So that word lose is not, it doesn't mean misplace. It's not like you lose your TV remote and have to go looking through the couch cushions, you know, for your psuche. Um, It is Greek apolumi. Apolumi meaning to destroy, to abolish, to utterly take out of the picture. Hence, we must destroy ourself, our psuche, in order to save our life. And that save, that's the sozo, as in the sozo health ministry, to, uh, to rescue or to heal. Um, but this, this is the central paradox I take. From this, And this is interesting because this is not just uh, a paradox uh, that we can take on faith just because we read it uh, in Scripture. This is actually something that social scientists have studied extensively, that the people who pour out their lives for others, again, the other, capital O, other people, other um, ways of being, uh, the people who pour out themselves for the other, are the most fulfilled, the happiest, the most joyful, the most well-adjusted people in the world. It's the people who try to hoard their life to themselves, that try to keep every, every coin, every second, everything that they think is theirs, and to pile it up and make it just about them and only for them and not spread anything out. And those people are the most miserable. Those are the ones who have the most meager of lives and relationships. And so we see this truth uh, supported by, this, by social science, but of course um, uh, spiritual leaders have had this insight across religions and, and across faith traditions uh, for centuries, millennia, that this, this is the way to life to abundant life, is to pour out your life as the more you give your life away, the more you are filled. And so if we destroy that self for the sake of Christ, for the sake of healing the broken, for feeding the hungry, again, this is what I take, and so the paradox is also that the gospel is self-referential, and it kind of folds back in on itself. So in one sense, the gospel is um, as Jesus proclaimed that, fir- it, that first time he stood up in the synagogue to, to preach the gospel was, you know, I bring good news to the poor. So to feed the hungry, to bring hope to the despairing, to bring forgiveness to the unforgivable, to live a life of generosity, this is the gospel. And so as we pour out our lives for others, pour out our lives in compassion and justice and forgiveness and, and healing and all of these things, the more our lives become full to overflowing, abundant, and even everlasting. So, 
we end with this fourth paradox. And again, this is very much a restatement, but in, in, a, in slightly different terms and a slightly different frame. So Jesus says, for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? And here, Jesus is kind of switching to financial metaphors. So he's talking about profit and loss. So gain or profit is ofele. And it also means kind of to bargain. So if you were to um, barter with someone and trade and so that you could get the better deal, that you were going to try to trade something and you weren't looking for an equal trade, you were looking to get a deal so that you would get something better for something of lesser value. And that lose is just the opposite. That's uh, zemiothenai, and that is uh, a loss. It's, it's in the debit column. It's in your loss column on your, on your spreadsheet. Um, and so this might be a humorous sort of rhetorical question to restate the paradox where Jesus says, what, do you think you can buy the world at a bargain by selling your soul? And of course the answer is no. And so, so this, but this idea that you can exchange your soul, your psuche, yourself, your life, your mind for the world. And again, this dynamic with the world because what the world considers shameful is what you're supposed to be lifting up. The self that the world has helped to mold and create is the self that you are rejecting. And so, uh, and so Jesus says, so what? You think, you think that by selling your soul, you're going to gain the world. That's, uh, that's a terrible trade. It's, a, it's terrible business practice. Um, spiritually speaking. So all of these four interlocking paradoxes interrelate, support each other, give some nuance and some fleshing out uh, to, again, what I think of as the gospel. And so to give um, a couple of real-world examples, uh, as many of you know, and as I mentioned here this morning, was the final worship service at Eastside Christian Church. And I preached this sermon a couple of weeks ago at Eastside Christian Church. And this is, I think, what Eastside did because they went through a discernment process. And they are a congregation full of, full of lovely people. But they discerned that for them to live out the gospel most faithfully, most authentically, that they should sell their building and give away all of their money and cease to be a visible physical congregation so that they could become part of the wider body of Christ and that they could do more for the gospel in that way. And I was so proud of them for making that decision and that discernment because there are so many congregations, especially American congregations, where the people, a lot of them just want to sit in their favorite pew on Sunday morning and listen to a, a happy, inspiring sermon and go home and not have to think about it the rest of the week, not have to come into the building the rest of the week. But to maintain a huge building like that, to pay a pastor a, a salary just to come in and, and make you feel better for an hour a week, that's not a good use of resources. It's not good stewardship. And they knew that because their DNA, since their founding as a congregation, they have been committed to outreach. They have been committed to loving the neighbor. They have been committed to that rejecting self in, uh, to pour out their lives for the other. And so, so they made this very painful, very, very difficult decision to say, we're going to close our congregation. We're going to distribute our financial assets. Our members are going to go to other congregations. And by the way, the money's not the big asset there. It's those people. The congregations that, that end up with those people, those are going to be some lucky congregations. Mark my words. So this, this paradox was being lived out by this congregation and is still. And so even though this was the final Sunday, this was the final worship service, it was powerful to me uh, that they had really done that. And they had really get, not only given themselves up for the sake of others, they had done it to save their life. And they had lifted up their cross because, of course, a congregation that is, has older members, that, doesn't, that is smaller, that uh, chooses to close, all of that in American Christianity, a lot of that is seen as weakness 
and seen as shame. Oh, you couldn't get more members. Oh, you know, you couldn't raise more money. Oh, you couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. And they said, no, no, we're being faithful. It's not about what the world says we should be ashamed of. It's not about what the world says that we should hide in disgrace. We are trying to be faithful to the gospel. And they were, and they are. And so I think that living out of that paradox uh, right now to me fills my heart and fills my soul uh, with gratitude. So, like I said, that's, that's what I take to be the heart, the, some of the distilled essence of the gospel, that paradox of, of giving up oneself in order to gain life and save one's life. Um, and like I said, you may have a different opinion, you may have a different way of wording it or thinking about it or framing it, um, and we can share that. And that's, that's one of the beautiful things about being in a community like Patchwork, is uh, we can share different thoughts and different experiences and different perspectives uh, on life and reality and paradox. So I invite you to do that in the comments section if you wish. Uh, go ahead, um, even if it's not at the very moment. If you have some thoughts about it in a day or two, go ahead and, and write them down and uh, send them our way and we'll have a conversation about it. But, but thank, you for, thank you for listening to me. <clears throat> so now we come to a time of sharing prayers, prayers of the people. Um, I noticed Sean had a prayer earlier. I'm trying to get back to it. Sean has prayers for her friends Rhonda with cancer and Alan Bozma on a ventilator in the ICU. So uh, for Rhonda and Alan, prayers of healing. Uh, Karen, prayers for the families and communities in Central America that have been wiped out by Hurricane Ada. So yes, uh, for the victims of the hurricane. Uh, we definitely lift them up in prayer. Um, let's see. And uh, prayers, as I said, for people at Eastside. Um, this was the final worship service. There's a lot of grieving going on, but there's also a lot of gratitude and a lot of hope uh, for the future. Um, and some different organizations that will be receiving some legacy gifts that will make a big difference, uh, including Patchwork Central. And so we, we do give thanks for that, and we give thanks for those people and those leaders uh, at Eastside Christian Church. We definitely pray for the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, certainly in our country, around the world, but also in our local area where hospital cases are spiking. Um, I know there was a story in the news the other day, and I know I personally, as an RN, I received an email uh, last week saying that uh, Deaconess Hospital is asking for reservist healthcare workers. Um, so there is definitely a crunch on healthcare workers. Uh, so we need to keep uh, the healthcare workers in our prayers. We need to keep the hospitals, the community, the, uh, our political leaders locally and statewide and nationally all in our prayers uh, during this time of pandemic. Um, continued prayers for the health and safety of Patchwork staff and volunteers and guests and clients as we all do the best we can to try to keep the programming going and still provide uh, that community, provide those services and activities that we provide while at the same time trying to have the protocols and the procedures to keep everyone as healthy and safe as possible. So prayers for Patchwork, uh, prayers for everyone involved here that we can remain safe and healthy and, and still uh, create our little corner of community uh, where we are. And uh, continued prayers for people living and working in nursing homes, other congregate settings. A few names of people that we're directly connected to uh, include Beth Stone, Helen Belleville, Diane Somm, um, but also congregate settings like uh, jails and prisons, people who are incarcerated. Um, Sean says, prayers for the healing of our country, absolutely. Uh, for the divisions, uh, the, and there are some deep divisions in our country. Uh, Jane Johansson, prayers for everyone looking at the holidays without their families because of COVID-19, absolutely. I know that's been a 
something that Amy and I have talked about, about um, probably not being able to be with our families uh, during these holidays and how difficult that is. Um, Sean celebrating our country's decision for new leadership. I'm going to say a word about that, um, about how do we pray about this election. Um, and I, I think, uh, again, we need to be a little careful and we need to uh, think, think theologically and think carefully about this. Um, because I know what I'm feeling, and I think many of you are feeling it too. I, I, we're feeling relief, feeling gratitude, feeling hope. Uh, and I think that's appropriate. I really do, because I think that it means, hopefully, that a lot of harm that would have been done otherwise will be avoided. Hopefully, some harm will be undone if it can be undone. That we have stopped a slide into fascism, in my opinion, and uh, that is certainly something to be celebrated. And that, uh, in some ways, there has been evil that has been stopped because of this election. But I want to make sure that as we pray about not going in a direction of fascism, as we pray about stopping some evil in the world, um, we don't pray in a gloating way over the people that have been defeated. I think we can pray for reconciliation, but we, again, we have to acknowledge that reconciliation does not mean some veneer of agree to disagree plastered over deep, systemic, pestilent injustices. We must have justice and accountability for there to be true reconciliation. So yes, we can pray for reconciliation, but we have to understand what that means. It means hard work. It means not accepting easy answers. It means not accepting just this civility of agree to disagree without really doing uh, some hard work. Now, on the other hand, I don't want to completely shut out the possibility of redemption for people maybe who were on the side of fascism, on the side of the human rights abuses, on the side of uh, an attempted coup against democracy. Um, all of, and I don't think any of those things are too dramatic to say. And so uh, we, need to we do need to have some balance here, and we need to make sure that we are firmly committed to justice and accountability. We need to make sure that we are committed to protecting victims, protecting uh, the oppressed, but also allowing a possibility and a chance for redemption. And that's a tough balance to strike. And we need to make sure that any process or dialogue around reconciliation, around concepts like forgiveness and repentance, need to have very robust definitions and need to be done with a lot of clarity and a lot of work so that we don't allow those processes of reconciliation or forgiveness or repentance to become ways that facilitate further abuse or gaslight the victims. And so these are complex prayers to have to pray and complex hopes to have for the future of our country, of its divisions, of healing, but also of rooting out those injustices that have been so clearly and dramatically laid bare by this pandemic and by this election. And another prayer um, from Jane Johansson, prayers and thanks for Gail Lafif and the Morning Coffee Program. Absolutely. For all of our uh, morning hosts and hostesses, uh, for morning coffee, for uh, shade tree hospitality, and forming communion uh, out on our front lawn. Uh, I think that's an important ministry um, and part of justice. Part of justice being done uh, is, is forming these communities. So let us join in a word of prayer after saying all that. God of paradox and mystery, we pray for healing. We pray for sozo, that word that means rescue from evil, that means creating wholeness out of brokenness, 
that word that is more a process than a state of being. We pray for that for individuals who are hurting and ill. We pray for Rhonda. We pray for victims of COVID. We pray for Beth and Helen and Diane. But we also pray for communities that are divided. We pray for a nation that is sick, both literally and metaphorically. We pray for hospitals and healthcare workers. We pray for Eastside Christian Church and all of its members. We pray for Patchwork staff and volunteers and guests and clients and hosts and hostesses. We pray about sitting around and having a cup of coffee. We pray that we can delve deeper into these mysteries and these paradoxes, that we can come to a greater understanding of the gospel, but that we can also live out those paradoxes in our own lives with greater and greater authenticity and faithfulness. God, we come before you speaking your holy name, that identity that we do not know. You said, you told Moses that your name is I am who I am, or also I will be who I will be. Your name is about complete and utter freedom to be, to love the other, to pour out your grace, to pour out yourself. And so we receive your grace and we ask that you give us the courage to pour out ourselves to pour out our lives so that we may gain life abundant. All of this we pray in the name of the one who taught us these paradoxes, Jesus Christ. Amen. We now come to a time for sharing gifts. So we have a few that uh, Amy sent out on the email list earlier this week. Um, so she thanks everyone who uh, wished her a happy birthday. Uh, it was on election day, which, you know, th this year, wow, what a, <laughs> what a thing to have your birthday on Tuesday. Um, but she really does appreciate everyone who helped provide her a distraction and helped, helped her celebrate uh, her birthday. The weather is a joy and a gift. Uh, it's been incredibly warm, and so we have this wonderful warm weather, but you can still go outside and and look at all the beautiful fall colors, the reds and golds uh, on the trees. And um, it's a little bit odd, but quite welcome. The gift the Kids in the Arts and Smarts program harvested sweet potatoes this week uh, with some help from Bill Hemminger. So certainly a big thanks to Bill and to all of the Patchwork staff and volunteers. Um, but for the gift of sweet potatoes and for the gift of getting to dig them up and to find that buried treasure, uh, is, is a great gift. And, uh, the, and as we've said, the election as a gift. And I think uh, even beside the outcome of the election, which I, I agree is a gift, um, but I think uh, another gift of the election was uh, the huge turnout, um, the amazing heroism of ordinary people, uh, ballot counters, poll workers, people who were working under very stressful conditions people who were working probably with threats against their safety and maybe even their lives. And they went in and they counted every ballot over and over because they believed in this thing called democracy. And I'm getting a little choked up here, you can tell. But their heroism, their everyday heroism, truly was and continues to be a gift. And let us all take our inspiration from that. There are other gifts. Okay. We now come to a time for celebrating communion, for celebrating this meal, this feast with each other. Unfortunately, we cannot do it in person and cannot taste uh, Nils's wonderful bread uh, all together, but. Um, but we thank Nils for making this bread, and we uh, invite you, 
wherever you are, to grab your bread, whatever it may be, your morsel of something to eat, and grab your cup, whether it has wine or juice or some other beverage in it. Uh, Grab those elements, and spiritually we will gather around this table and partake together. So this is a ritual of paradox. Jesus gathered in that upper room with his disciples, and he wanted to give them something to try to explain the paradox that was going to be coming, that that ultimate paradox that he was going to die, that he was going to give his life. But it was through that death that new life and resurrection could come. And so he took the bread and he said, you know what, it's like this bread. It's one loaf, it's unified. But it can't stay unified. You all have to break it apart and everyone has to take a piece and everyone has to eat a piece. And so it is through the brokenness that the bread becomes whole and represents wholeness for those of us who eat. It is only through the bread being broken that we can achieve wholeness and unity and union with Christ. It is that paradox in a tangible, concrete form. And Jesus said, And drink of this cup, all of you. The new covenant in my blood is poured out in this cup. And that's another paradox that you pour out your blood. And remember, in ancient Israel, the blood was life. It was a metaphor and believed to hold the the vital element of life, and that's why animals had to be drained of their blood before they could be eaten. That, you, that the life has to be poured out, whether it's drop by drop or in, a, or in a whole gushing waterfall. But as the life is poured out, the cup, instead of becoming empty, it overflows with grace and with love. And so Jesus says, my blood's going to be poured out But only by pouring yourselves out will you gain that new life, will you gain that overflowing grace. And that, I think, is the new covenant. Jesus says, if you follow this covenant, if you follow this paradox, if you really live out my words of giving yourself away in order to save your own life, then you have entered that covenant. And so this meal is a symbol of that agreement of trying to live more deeply and authentically into that paradox and of following Jesus. And so let us prepare to partake together. For it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night before he was broken in body and died, that he took this bread and he gathered with his disciples and he took the bread and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, in like manner, he took the cup, and he said, drink of this cup, all of you, for poured out in this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine with you again until we drink it new in the resurrection, God's new earth under God's new heaven. So you may take your bread and dip it in your cup, or you may eat the bread and drink from the cup however you prefer to do it. Now we've got some uh, time for a few announcements. Um, I noticed that Sean put an announcement up here. We are in need of a hospitality volunteer on Monday, tomorrow. Regular volunteer is not available tomorrow. So if we have someone uh, who could serve as a hospitality volunteer tomorrow morning, uh, please let us know and we will get that going. 
A um, couple of announcements. Uh, next Sunday, November 15th, uh, we have scheduled a community meeting. We will do that by Zoom, uh, especially with the explosion of cases and with the, the hospitals and the healthcare system <clears throat> so, uh, so strained at the moment. Uh, we really need to practice our, our uh, due diligence, our vigilant uh, health and safety protocols. So we will definitely continue meeting by Zoom for the foreseeable future for our community meetings. So we will do that uh, after worship next Sunday. Um, and if you uh, are getting the patchwork emails, uh, Amy will send that Zoom link along with uh, the email in that, uh, uh, to everyone on that list. Uh, if you're watching this and you're not on that list and you want to be on that list or you want to uh, join us in our community meeting, please just contact Amy uh, and get on that email list uh, and we'll get you in there. Another announcement, um, the CAGE Virtual Community Problems Assembly is going to be happening a week from tomorrow, November 16th. Uh, so that'll be Monday, November 16th at 6.30 p.m. That's also a Zoom uh, assembly meeting. Um, so if you're interested in participating in that, uh, you can contact me. Um, and uh, we uh, will send out that link to the regular patchwork list. Uh, but if you're, again, if you're not on that list or not sure about it, but want to participate, make sure you uh, contact me about that. All right. Oh, looks like we already have a, a volunteer. Looks like Nancy Bach is volunteering for tomorrow morning. So... Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, all right. I don't see any other announcements. Do you have any, Amy? Nope. nope. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for worship, and uh, let the people of God say, Amen. <laughs>